Time for questions to the Minister for Infrastructure. And we start with the list of questions. And I call Andrew Muir to ask the first question. Mr. Question Mr. number one, Mr. Speaker. Fight the Minister. Yep. Speaker, uh, the bicycle strategy that the member refers to was published by one of my predecessors in August 2015. The strategy was based on three pillars to build a comprehensive network for the bicycle, to support people who choose to travel by bicycle, and to promote the bicycle as a mode of transport for everyday journeys. There were no specific targets set out in the strategy, but a number of ministerial ambitions related to significantly increasing the proportion of shorter journeys made by bicycle. This desire to increase cycling journeys is reflected in the programme for government, and my commitment to increase the proportion of journeys made by walking, cycling and public transport. In order to achieve this, I want to ensure that in all transportation interventions, my department includes measures to improve walking and cycling as key components of the project, particularly in urban areas. I want to build infrastructure that makes walking and cycling journeys easier, safer and more convenient to undertake, including segregated and separated lanes and paths on the road, quiet streets where motor traffic is not allowed to predominate and traffic-free paths away from roads. Finally, I want to support councils in their development of greenways right across the north. I call Andrew Muir for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. Um, the Belfast Bicycle Network, which arises from the strategy, has targets within that and would require 12,500 metres each year to meet those targets. In 1920, only 120 metres of cycleway was created. In the Republic of Ireland's programme for government, they have committed to 20 per cent of their transport capital budget being allocated to active travel. At this point, I would declare that I was previously an employee of TransLink. Will the Minister commit to making a similar allocation within the budget for the next financial year? I thank the member um, for his question and I think that one of the positivities to come from COVID is that we are seeing an increase in people engaging in active travel and um, particularly in the area of cycling. Uh, the member will know that um, I have appointed a walking and cycling champion in my department and that's to demonstrate that this policy area uh, and this commitment is at the centre of the work of my department. Uh, you will also be aware that I have allocated a new blue-green fund uh, of £20 million and we're very keen to see uh, more cycling infrastructure uh, to see the further development uh, of greenways as well in particular. And the member also refers to the Belfast Cycle Network. And I would hope to publish the Belfast uh, Bicycle Network before the end of the year. And this will set out the priority cycling routes for Belfast. But I'm very keen to try to see this agenda progress right across council areas. And so I would be very keen to see this replicated in towns and cities right across Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you. And before I call the next speaker, uh, next questioner, I just need to remind members that questions seven and nine have both been withdrawn. So I call Trevor Clark. Oh, sorry, I'm way ahead of myself. I need to bring back Roy or Christopher. Um, and I call Michelle McElveen, please. Speaker, and thank the minister for responses. As the minister will be aware, momentum is growing in certain areas to move greenway projects forward. Will the Minister give a commitment to contact councils to encourage them to fully consult with landowners with a view to reaching agreement for routes in order to avoid vesting land? I thank the member um, for her question. My walking and cycling champion uh, wrote out to all of the councils um, in July, if I recollect correctly, asking them to be submitting proposals um, around Greenway. So we're very keen to be working in partnership with councils to address the areas that you have highlighted as well. Uh, I would like us to be in a, a much more advantageous situation in terms of Greenways, um, but there's money within my Blue Green Fund to be able to work, work forward on design and feasibility and also working in partnership with landowners, local communities as well, which is really important, and councils to try to address and preempt any difficulties that might emerge so that we can make as much progress as possible. Thank you. And I call Karen Mullen. Minister, in, in the Department's recent survey on student travel behaviour has shown that only 3% of students cycle as part of their journey to school, even though we know 50% of young people live within less than three kilometres from their school. Can I ask what your department is doing to encourage cycling 
as well as working to expand the educational programmes such as active school travel. And the member makes a very important point that the survey did show, and I think almost every survey that has been conducted around active travel, particularly in cycling, has demonstrated that people, more people of all ages would cycle if they had safer infrastructure and space to be able to do that. We are engaged in a number of pilot projects and we're working with Sustrans so that we can have cycling proficiency in schools because we think that's very important in terms of the cultural change that's required. Um, we are looking at a number of schools to see about cycling uh, routes, what we can progress there. And then obviously the member will be aware that I announced funding for the 20 mile per hour uh, speed limit to be rolled out around 100 schools uh, this financial year. Uh, it doesn't solve the problem, but again, it's about creating that safer environment for children to be able to walk and cycle safely to school. And I call Rachel Woods. Um, and thank you, Minister. Can I ask the Minister how much funding is allocated to the bicycle strategy currently for this financial year? Thank the member for her question. We have an allocated money as such to the actual strategy itself. What we're hoping to do is because it's capital money is to be able to utilise the money to be able to advance a number of projects within um, the scheme, but also any other ideas that councils or communities come forward with in terms of advancing the whole cycling um, agenda. Okay, moving on to question two, we'll call Trevor Clark. Uh, question number two. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will answer questions two and three together. Uh, my officials are continuing to um, progress the application at pace in line with planning policy to a point where a decision is ready to be made. When all consultation responses are received and all statutory processes complete, a recommendation will be brought forward by my officials. I am keen to bring a resolution to this long-standing application for the sake of all involved, but if a sound decision is to be reached, it is important the planning process is completed correctly. At this time, my officials are liaising with colleagues in DERA in relation to the updating of a statement of need for the facility in the context of the proposed development and of the strategic and long-term needs for waste management and the circular economy in Northern Ireland. When that response is received, officials will complete their assessment of the planning application. At this time, I cannot confirm when a recommendation will be made, and in the interim, I hope the members appreciate it would not be appropriate for me to comment on the individual planning merits or otherwise of this application. And I call Trevor Clark for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank uh, the Minister for her answer? Um, given the Minister prior to her appointment has maybe been publicly supportive of the No R21 campaign, does the Minister believe then that she may be conflicted when it comes, uh, follows the, the due process to come to the decision making process, that she would have to abdicate from that position and pass that to someone else? It is well known that I supported uh, No Arc 21 in my role as MLA for North Belfast. However, I am now the Infrastructure Minister and as such I am guided by the Ministerial Code of Conduct as well as the Pledge of Office I took when I accepted the portfolio for the Department of Infrastructure. As Infrastructure Minister, it is important to me that any planning decision taken is robust and sustainable and that it is taken in an open and transparent manner on its planning merits. As such, I will not come to any conclusions on the processing of this application until I have carefully considered the report and recommendations of my planning officials. I call Steve Egan for something. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker. And may I make a declaration of interest? Because previously, along with the Minister in previous guises, I have stood on the platform for No Art 21 and believe very strongly that this incinerator is nothing more than a Ponzi scheme. But the question I would like to ask the Minister, bearing in mind the length of time this has been taken, could she outline for us the costs that have been accrued by the taxpayer for the considerable amount of legal activity that is ongoing since one of her predecessors made very clear that this project should not go forward? And can she furnish those costs directly to the Assembly so we can review whether this has been good value for money by our department or indeed anybody else? Mr Speaker, I don't have that information to hand, but happy to take that away and provide information as required. Okay, thank you. And I call Jim Allister. Does the Minister agree that whether it's this decision or any other planning decision, pursuant to the Executive Functions Act, 
she can now make that decision without recourse to the executive and without waiting any amendment to the ministerial code. Does she agree with that? I do. With the granting of royal assent to the Executive Committee Functions Bill on the 21st of August, the Executive Committee Functions Act 2020 is now in effect. Uh, this Act, by its amendment of the Northern Ireland Act, clarifies that any infrastructure minister, both now and in the future, can take planning decisions which are the statutory responsibility of the Department of Infrastructure. As such, and I see the taking of planning decisions as an important component in assisting our recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. I intend to begin making decisions shortly on a number of planning applications which officials have been working on to bring to a decision point. Having considered legal advice, I am satisfied that the amendments to the Northern Ireland Act allow me as Minister for Infrastructure to take planning decisions from the period of royal assent. And I call Jerry Carroll. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, considering the weight uh, and size of opposition to this application uh, from communities and also from most parties in this chamber, uh, and considering the detrimental impact this application will have uh, on the environment, does the Minister agree with me that this project should not proceed any further? Um, uh, as I outlined in one of the previous um, responses, uh, as a Minister for Infrastructure, I have to ensure that due process is completed, and therefore it would not be appropriate for me to comment any further on the application. Can I call John Blair? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask further to the questions that the, the Minister has answered? If uh, any future decision making process around this application will take into full consideration revisited and reviewed environmental concerns, uh, consultation with the relevant environmental agencies, particularly with regard to air quality and whether or not recycling and being replaced by burning our waste is, is a good idea. I can confirm to the member that in the consideration um, of this application and in its um, analysis by my planning officials, all relevant information will be scrutinised and reviewed. Nicole Flynn. Uh, Mia, but I, can call you. Um, I would just like to ask the Minister on the topic of planning um, applications. I know that obviously um, a lot of people are waiting in anticipation around the Casement Park um, decision, and I know you mentioned in one of your answers previously there that you will be considering some of these decisions soon. Um, I'm just wondering, would you have at this stage any sort of timeline um, when the public could expect the decision just specifically on casement. Thank you. I thank the member for her question. Um, and as she points out, I have previously stressed the need for a progression of this long-awaited application. And my officials continue to work at pace so it can be brought forward for a decision. Officials have substantively completed their assessment of the application and are presently considering a recently submitted objection to the application. It is important that due process is followed if a sound decision is to be made, and it is hoped that a recommendation on this significant application can be brought forward shortly. Okay, moving on to question four, I'll call Cahill Boylan. Hey, Margaret, John Carlin, can I welcome you back to uh, Kirst Everett Cahar. Let her hold question number four, please. Um, I was in Newcastle on Tuesday the 25th of August visiting homes and meeting residents and could see for myself the extent of the flooding, the damage and disruption to properties and the very understandable upset from people. My department has developed very effective emergency planning arrangements and these worked well. Following the weather warning issued by the Met Office, my department's operational teams and multi-agency partners were in a heightened state of awareness from Monday the 24th of August and were ready to respond to the threat of flooding. Subsequently, on Tuesday morning, a multi-agency response in Newcastle was quickly established with operational teams and multi-agency partners present from early morning distributing several thousand sandbags, pumping and providing assistance to property owners. It is believed approximately 40 millimetres of rain fell in just under six hours. That's roughly 50 per cent of the monthly average. At this stage, a partial blockage to a bridge on the Bransford Road that occurred as a result of the high water levels in the Shimna River, carrying debris down the watercourse, is also thought to have been a contributory factor to the flooding. In order to reduce the likelihood of flooding in this area again, I am committed to delivering the Shimna Flood Alleviation Scheme in Newcastle. It is due to commence on site next summer, and I have asked officials to do all that they can to accelerate delivery of this important project. 
Carl Boylan, supplementary. Carl Mugget, can I thank the Minister for her answers? And the Minister is well aware of the stress and the concern and the worry of the residents. But leading up to the storm, there was reports to the Department in relation to debris and trees uh, along the river. Can the Minister clarify when exactly they responded to that? Or what does he do in relation to that? On the Department of Mugget. I thank the member um, for his question. At 12.45, the department received a report from the PSNI that debris had built up at the Bransford Road Bridge that crosses the River Shimna, and this was blocking the flow of water. Um, action was taken um, to remove that. And I would say to members, because I know uh, how close uh, we are to our constituents, we're always keen to learn in the department. Uh, we put in a number of measures in advance. We couldn't foresee the exact location of the flooding or the extent. It was very much unprecedented. But we are keen to always learn and improve. So if members are aware of things that were brought to the attention of the department or things that they think we should have done better, I would be keen to hear them so that we can try to implement any learning going forward. I think I'm going to call Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I find it very strange that uh, the department has been criticised uh, in a lack of preparedness for this especially given that there's been three years when we had no minister in post and the difficulties that were arisen during that time were not overcome. So does the minister agree with me that those who were responsible for those three years' delays and not removing the obstacles owe a responsibility to those who were flooded and as they should take their responsibility and contribution for it rather than attempt to blame the department for what resulted? I thank the member for his question. Um, First and foremost, I feel for the residents because they shouldn't have had to undergo that horrendous experience. I also think of the frontline workers, both roads and rivers in the Department for Infrastructure, but also emergency response teams as well, who were working tirelessly to try to protect people and property. And I understand that with politics, you know, party politics sometimes comes in uh, to play. Uh, and I can understand why you have said what you have. But for the residents, they just want to know when is this scheme going to be implemented to prevent a reoccurrence. And when I was down in Newcastle, I gave them my commitment that we would be on site with a scheme next year. And I said very clearly to my officials, the senior director, in front of the residents, that I wanted everything to be done that can be done to escalate that and to bring that project um, forward as quickly as possible. I think residents don't want to hear us bickering and fighting among ourselves. I think what they want uh, is action, and that's what I've committed to doing as Minister for Infrastructure. And I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Minister. And Minister, I know from speaking to party colleagues, I very much appreciated your very swift attendance uh, at the scene of the flooding. Uh, Minister, are there any other particular hotspot areas uh, that have been brought to your attention uh, where there may well be flood uh, uh, alleviation schemes already in the pipeline, but unfortunately, as Mr Beggs has rightly pointed out, had been held up uh, uh, because there was no Stormont Executive and Assembly for the last three years? Well, I think in the area of flood alleviation, and I think right across all government departments, um, there are many things that would be advanced, uh, advanced and implemented uh, if the Assembly had been sitting for um, the past three years. Uh, but as I say, our focus now has to be on we're all in post. Um, we have a lot of challenges. Flood is a hugely challenging area. We have had significant uh, underinvestment in our water and wastewater infrastructure for several years. We're also in the face of climate uh, emergency, so we're seeing flooding incidents happening on a much more regular basis. So we need to have a concerted effort right across all government departments, working with residents, working with local communities, um, to try to do what we can to prevent these situations occurring. And I would like to say, I was down in Newcastle, and the sense of community spirit was uh, overwhelming. Even when people were standing up to their knees in water in their own properties, they were looking out for their neighbours. Local businesses rallied around to provide food free for the emergency services and the frontline workers. Um, so even in the midst of all of that distress, I took heart from the fact that the community spirit, certainly in Newcastle and as well in Straban, experienced flooding, um, was really very strong and very positive. Moving on to question five, I call John Blair. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number five. The member will be aware of my announcement about funding of £20 million for the blue green infrastructure, which will support our communities through transformation, promoting active travel, and shaping our places to live in the new normal. 
I am keen to see progress on better walking and cycling infrastructure throughout Northern Ireland and am currently considering the basis upon which funding may be allocated for cycling infrastructure. Specifically in South Antrim, my officials are currently developing proposals to improve walking and cycling in the constituency and have recently completed a shared use path at Lock and Moor Road, Antrim. My department is working in partnership with councils and stakeholders in identifying and taking forward schemes that deliver on our programme for government outcomes and ensure lasting change for people across the north. Greenways are an important part of this positive change and part of the blue-green infrastructure funding has been identified to support councils in delivering more of their greenway schemes. I am keen to work with all councils and stakeholders in the development of safe active travel routes throughout the north and would encourage councils to liaise with the walking and cycling champion in my department on suggestions for projects in their local areas. John Blair, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister not only for that, that, an, that answer and the detail in, but also her various replies for, from herself and officials on that, on that issue to me in, in, in recent times. Can I ask, uh, the, as a supplementary, Mr. Speaker, can the Minister provide an update on Greenway projects previously identified, specifically those for the South Antrim area from Ballyclare to Ballymena, and also from Doke Ballyclare to Draperstown, which were previously identified in consultations? Um, uh, as I've said, I'm keen to see progress, um, and it's very important that we work in partnership with councils. Councils are very well placed to be leading on these projects, and I'm saying very clearly that I want to do what I can to support them. Uh, also, under the programme for government, you know, greenways are an important part of the positive change that we're seeking to um, achieve. Um, under the small grants for greenways programme, Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council received funding to develop a feasibility study for the Doak de Larne Greenway. And in 2018, further funding was provided to develop a detailed design. Uh, following the announcement of the Blue Green Infrastructure Fund, my, councils wrote, or my officials wrote to all councils in July asking for details of greenway projects that are ready uh, to be taken forward to construction. I understand that from that exercise, further work is required on this particular scheme, but I wish to reiterate again to the member that I'd be keen to do what I can to support that uh, and be happy to have further engagement with the councils on how we work together to bring that forward. Nicole Pat Sheegan. I thank, I thank the Minister for her answer so far. I wonder, could the Minister uh, tell us what her plans are for expanding cycle paths in general uh, as a key element of the active travel infrastructure? Thank the member um, for his question. Uh, and I'm very keen to see the extension of cycle paths and separated cycle paths. I've also been very clear, though, that if we're trying to bring about positive and lasting change, then we can't oppose change from on high, top down. We need to be working with local communities. We need to be working with councils and local reps as well um, to understand what changes will work best um, in those areas. We've been engaging primarily with the councils in that regard, um, but I am also uh, had a, a really positive stakeholder meeting um, with groups right across the spectrum when it comes to active travel. Uh, and I hope to shortly be announcing a challenge fund, and that would be for communities themselves, community groups and others, to be able to bid for, so that we can bring the type of projects that the member refers to in the right locations right across the north. And I call Trevor Clark. Much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and can I also thank the Minister for her answers? <coughs> she referenced uh, one, of the cycle path, or sorry, one of the paths, in particular on the Loch and Moor Road, which is a good job. However, can I ask the Minister, I mean, some of the communities want to be active, particularly in the rural areas where they have nowhere to walk. Um, but the criteria has been fairly stringent over the years in relation to the assessments that her department carry out for those to qualify. Can the minister give us a commitment that she would look at those assessments to make it much easier for those communities to actually qualify to have these paths so they can be active? I'm very conscious of the point that the member makes. I'm sort of caught between a bind where I have to have an objective matrix and sense of assessment so that I can fairly um, assess proposals going forward. But since I announced um, the £20 million Blue Green Fund, I have had a number of correspondence from, from residents in rural areas talking about the even lack of extended pavements for them to go out walking. So it's something that I've asked uh, my officials to look at to see. At the beginning, when I announced this fund, the focus was 
was on urban areas because we were looking to see pilot projects in city centres and town centres that we could get up and running. But I am very mindful that there are rural communities and that they need to be able to avail of this fund. So I don't know whether it's we look at the um, assessment criteria or maybe through the challenge fund we try to do something more to encourage active travel routes in our, in our rural communities. Uh, moving on to question six, William Irwin. Number six, Mr Speaker. Um, um, Mr. Speaker, um, with your permission, I will answer questions 6 and 14 together. Um, the DVA has reinstated driver testing services where testing can be done safely in line with PHA advice and guidance on social distancing requirements. This includes motorbike driving testing from the 6th of July and tests for drivers of buses, tractors and Module 4 CPC tests for lorry, bus and coach drivers from the 20th of July. From the 1st of September, Category B, which is private car, and Category C, lorry, driving tests have resumed, initially prioritising those requests from key workers, followed by those customers whose tests were cancelled due to lockdown. The DBA has directly contacted around 200 key workers and offered them a driving test. Officials are now in the process of contacting those customers who had their driving test cancelled between March and June to arrange a driving test appointment with them. The DVA estimates that it will take between six to eight weeks to clear this backlog, after which the driving test booking system will be open to the general public to book a test. The DVA will continue to work with staff and trade unions in the coming weeks to ensure testing is conducted in line with public health advice and guidance to ensure the safety of all. The Craigavon Test Centre continues to be used for COVID testing and given the very worrying rise uh, in the spread of the virus in the area, I believe that this is a very important uh, service in the fight against the virus. While this does not greatly impact vehicle testing, Driver testing services cannot be safely recommenced until the site is vacated. Candidates wishing to be tested at Craigavon will have a choice of other test centre locations, but I do appreciate the inconvenience this is causing to driving instructors and candidates. My understanding is that the centre will no longer be needed by the Department of Health from mid-October. And in the meantime, officials are working with the Public Health Agency to enable driving tests to be restored at the Craig Evan Test Centre as soon as is practicable once an alternative site for the COVID-19 testing has been identified. Officials have also met with a representative group of instructors from the Craig Evan area to identify if there are any alternative workable solutions for the temporary provision of driving tests in a different location in the Craig Evan area in the interim. Okay, could I just remind the Minister there's two minutes for a question, but I appreciate there was a double bumper you had there. Uh, William Irwin, supplementary. Thank the Minister for a response. The Minister will accept that Craigavon Test Centre, uh, driving test centre, is the second biggest, largest in Northern Ireland. And given that at this moment the test can take place there, uh, it certainly is adding a, it's a larger area. Uh, and you have to, those young people have to test in either Newry, Lisbon or probably Amah, and it's totally impractical practical for this to happen. Will the Minister, Minister assure me as soon as practically possible that this test centre will be up and running again? Yes, and, and I said I do appreciate um, the inconvenience that it is causing, and while a case can be made that you know, if you're to pass your driving test, you, could, you should be expected to be able to drive on any road and be tested on any road, I do accept that it, is, it adds nerves to the situation, and it's not, it's not a, an ideal situation at all for people to be inconvenienced and disrupted in this way. As I say, we've been working with our colleagues in health, and our understanding is that uh, they will no longer need to use the grounds in mid-October but I recognise that there is still a difficulty in the interim, and that is why we have been engaging with the local driving uh, instructors. And they have uh, suggested a number of possible uh, interim solutions, and those are being explored by DVA staff. And DVA staff have committed to going back uh, to local driving instructors to be able to update them on progress. I uh, call Dolores Kelly. <clears throat> thank you, Minister, and thank you for your work on this issue. And indeed, the rise in COVID uh, at local level is something of uh, major concern to us all. Uh, but, Minister, you did say that there was ongoing communication with driving instructors. I take it that they'll play a key role in the consultation and the agreement around alternative sites. And could we have some idea of a time frame for when that might be resolved? 
I thank the member for her question, and I know that she has been championing this issue along with um, local representatives in the area. Um, yes, we have engaged locally with the driving instructors, and they have suggested a number of alternative um, sites in the Craig Gavin area. Those are being explored. We also explored the possibility of actually being able to carry out both on site. Um, the risk assessment um, said that that wasn't the right way to proceed. That was from within my own department, but also our health colleagues felt that that was too risky. Mm -hmm. That risk has been heightened by the fact that with the increase in the spread of the virus, we have seen quite a significant increase in the demand for services um, there. But as I say, the Department of Health is indicating they won't need the site from mid-October, which will provide a lasting solution, if you like, to the, to the issue, but we are looking to explore what could be done in the interim. And as I say, DVA has met with driving instructors and is committed to going back this week to update them. That ends the period for a list of questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call on Colm gilder -New. A topical chest ever again. Topical question number one, please. Hmm. No, you have to ask the you question. You want me to ask it? Okay. So, Minister, in recent weeks there have been concerns over a lack of social distancing and in terms of capacity on public transport, including on the Belfast to Dublin train line. And I'm just wondering what assurances can you give that such issues are being addressed? I thank the member for his question, and I'm aware of the incident that he referred to on the Enterprise. Um, there were technical difficulties, as I understand it, with another train which reduced capacity, uh, and it was an unacceptable situation, uh, and it shouldn't happen uh, again, and learning has been implemented. I have to say a number of measures were taken when the situation started to unfold. Um, passengers were advised that there was alternative bus provision. Um, a number declined to take that up, um, and we have taken learning from that um, and are implementing that going forward. Um, I have to say, though, that um, while that situation was unacceptable, it, wasn't, it isn't a common occurrence, um, thank goodness, and I think that's testimony to the fact that TransLink have put on a number uh, of additional contingency measures. So, for example, there's additional capacity on standby if required, if we can see that the passenger numbers are going to make social distancing um, difficult. This is a very challenging environment, but it's one that we're keeping under constant review um, and trying to implement learning um, as we go along. Colm Gillerney, supplementary. Um, would the Minister agree with me on the need for the strongest possible messaging to encourage compliance with COVID-19 measures on public transport? Uh Absolutely. I completely agree. We need a very strong and uniform message. Uh, the member will know that I moved to bring in mandatory face coverings on our public transport. Prior to that, there was only around 10 per cent of our passengers wearing face coverings. In the most recent uh, survey that has been conducted, there are up to 86 per cent uh, of passengers who are wearing face coverings. I think that is a very positive sign. Um, but absolutely, we have to be very mindful. We can see what is happening in Craig Alvin. Um, this virus is still very much um, uh, amongst us, and we are all still very much at risk of it. So it's very important that we follow all of the public health advice. I think some of us think hand washing is a small and minor thing. It's actually critically important. Social distancing is critically important, and there's an onus on all of us to be conveying that message at every opportunity. I call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back as well to the chamber. Um, can I just um, ask the minister? I am one of those people who has now received a second date for their MOT, which is perfectly fine, and that's okay, and I understand that. Can I just ask um, why we have moved to an almost paperless system when it comes to MOT certificates? Yes, we moved to the automatic issuing of temporary uh, exemption certificates. Uh, there was a lot of confusion uh, around the TEC process. People weren't sure did they have to apply, was it being issued automatically, when they were getting the certificate in the post. Uh, and so we tried to move to an automated system to reassure people that once you come for your MOT to expire, you will be automatically issued with a temporary exemption certificate. That was to take some of the pressure off the customer and to reassure them they didn't need to be doing anything and that DVA would be doing that on their behalf. Um, you can also go on to a website. It's the DVLA's website. But once you put you, the member's nodding, so the member has done this, um, you put in your registration details and that will confirm to you that a TEC has issued and obviously then you can tax your vehicle. But it's always important to remind people that responsibility for the safety of your vehicle rests with the vehicle um, owner and that applies equally at all times. Paula Bradley, supplementary. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the, the Minister for her answer so far? Um, Minister, I, I think this, you'd said that it was to decrease confusion. I think it has actually increased confusion. I know certainly amongst um, people, older people within our community, I know my own father has had my done my head in over recent weeks about his MOT certificate because people are used to seeing a certificate. It's called an exemption certificate. And I know from my office perspective as well, we've had many people have phoned up because they're unaware um, because their MOT has been changed again. So could I just ask that you maybe look at that for some of those more vulnerable people um, that maybe don't have the same access to, to online or don't have a, the, the ability to navigate that? And it is an important point. I suppose we're caught between, you know, a very strong um, push for putting all of our services online in this digital age. But as you say, there are people who aren't able to access. And so I will take it away and look at it. Um, I can't see us reversing the automation, but maybe there is more that we could do around ensuring that the message of automation is communicated in a very accessible way, for example, to older citizens. Um, so I'll take that away and have a think about how we might be able to better raise awareness among the community. And I call Gemma Dolan. Um, is the Minister aware of the unacceptable sewerage problems facing residents in Gallia Shore and Enniskillen? I am uh, aware of the situation in Gallia Shore uh, and it is an unacceptable situation. It's also a very complex situation in the fact that the water and sewage system is not owned by Northern Ireland Water. Though Northern Ireland Water have uh, on a few occasions stepped in in terms of pumping uh, when the situation was particularly bad. Um, it, notwithstanding that it is a very complicated issue, it is something that I'm looking at. Uh, I'm very mindful that Northern Ireland Water doesn't have the resources in order to be able to meet its statutory duties and obligations, and this would be outside of it. But certainly I'm willing to have engagement with the Finance Minister to see if he might be able to assist in finding a, a financial solution to the situation. Gemma Dolan, supplementary. And thank you, Minister, for your answer. Um, would the Minister agree to accompany me on a visit to Gallia Shore and to provide residents um, with reassurance that these, address, these issues will be addressed? I'm always happy to meet residents. I think for that meeting to be as useful as it could be, it would be important that I have the engagement with the Finance Minister in the first instance, so that when I'm going down, hopefully I'll be able to give them a, a progress on how those discussions might be going. I call Chris Little, question four. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Education Minister has referenced the need for an increase in the amount of journeys to school made by walking and cycling. Can I ask the Minister for Infrastructure if the Department of Education contributes any funding to the Department of Infrastructure Public Health Agency Active Schools Travel Programme? My understanding is that um, it's Public Health Agency and the Department for Infrastructure, though I will stand to be corrected if the Department for Education is contributing financially. But what I think the question does um, demonstrate is that if we're trying to address these issues, we need to come at it in a, a partnership approach. Public finances are extremely tight, um, and I think when we pool our resources, we can actually make much greater progress. So happy to engage with the Education Minister and other ministers as well to see how we can work together in terms of having a common policy approach in these areas, but also being able to bring the resources and the public, and public messaging to ensure that we can make as much progress as possible. Uh, we are in a climate emergency. I think active travel is an important element of that. Um, but we also need to drive cultural change. And as the Eco Schools Initiative has proven very successfully, when you're changing that culture and behaviour in schools, it has a lasting impact, not just on the young people, but also from their parents uh, as well. So happy to work with any minister uh, and the all party group on cycling as well in that matter, Chris. I call Chris Little, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for her response uh, and welcome her commitment to work with the Minister of Education to increase active travel journeys to school. Uh, can I ask the Minister if, by part of that engagement, she has any plans to increase on road cycle proficiency training available to school pupils? As a member will know, we are involved in cycling proficiency initiatives and we make, uh, we make a contribution to that. I suppose the challenge for me as a department is that I have very little wriggle room when it comes to resource expenditure. I would like to be doing so much more, but it just is a very challenging environment and that kind of curtails at what I would like to be able to achieve. But I very much recognise the importance of this initiative and would like to do what I can to try to help it. Question five, William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In relation to 20 mile an hour speed limits at schools, 
Can the minister inform me how many schools in your area I'm at has been able to avail of this, will be able to avail of the scheme? Um, uh, so, uh, as I referenced earlier, the member will know that um, I'd allocated £2 million to see the rollout of this scheme, uh, and we we're estimating around 100 schools this financial year. Um, the way that that has broken down the 100 schools is we have taken them uh, 25 schools per division. And we have carried out uh, an assessment which is complete. Uh, this afternoon, we should be publishing the list of 100 schools. And I would say it will cause some disappointment to schools. And I would like to be doing so much more. We're in a very constrained period of time to be able to deliver on this. But we're working at, at pace. And I'm writing out to schools as well today to advise those who will be included in the scheme uh, that they will be. But also to those schools who weren't successful this time round, to assure them that I want to see this, pro this programme rolled out going forward uh, and would hope to be in a position to commit further funding to it so that we can see it extended to many more schools. William Irwin, supplementary. I thank the Minister for her response. And, uh, I too would encourage the Minister to rule that scheme out as widely as possible. I am aware that the Minister just recently uh, announced a road safety community fund scheme. Uh, will this scheme be available to schools to apply to? Yeah, this, this is a fund of £100,000 and individuals and groups um, can make an application for a grant up to £10,000. Be very keen to see that money spent and it's just for people who have any ideas or initiative about promoting road safety in their area. I'd be really keen to see projects coming forward that are very much focused on active travel as well and road safety around those issues. So I would appreciate any support that the member could give in terms of raising awareness of that grant scheme and encourage people within your constituency to apply. Tom. Question six, William Humphrey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for answer so far. The Minister will be aware that on the 1st of July this year, the SDLP proposed a motion in Belfast City Council with regard to buses coming from North Belfast and Greater Shankill into the city centre in Donegal Place in particular. This has caused real concern, real concern to my constituents and yours, to the Belfast Chamber of Commerce, and I met the uh, Chief Executive over the summer, and indeed to TransLink, and I met the Chief Executive of that organisation uh, over the summer as well. Can I ask the Minister, it's important to get the balance between people being able to trans trans be transported into the city centre, the environment, and in terms of the, 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 the progression of the city, which has been devastated in recent years with the bank buildings far and more recently with COVID. Can I ask the Minister, is the Minister in support of this proposal? I'm willing to consider all proposals, but as you say, we need to get the balance right. And I've been saying in terms of the active travel work that I've been doing, and even transportation plans, we need to be feeding into local communities and getting their feedback on it. So I'm happy to take the issue up uh, and discuss it further with the member or any of the residents that he might have who have been contacting him with concerns. Well, Mr. Further to that, and I thank you for our answer. Have you discussed those concerns with the Chief Executive of TransLink, which is an arms link body company within your own organisation, and with Mr. Simon Hamilton, Chief Executive? of the Chamber of Commerce? No, I haven't. I've met with Simon Hamilton, um, but we discussed a range of issues. Um, this wasn't one of the particular issues that he raised, but as I say, I'm happy to engage um, with all partners and stakeholders on it and happy to, to meet with, with TransLink as well. I'm in discussions with TransLink on a very regular basis, particularly as we respond to COVID, be in very regular contact, getting reviews and updates about how we're managing that situation. So certainly happy to have discussions uh, with anyone, try to address any concerns people might have. William Humphrey, Humphrey supplementary. All right, Mark Durkin, question seven. Dear Mayor, thank the Minister for her answers thus far. The Minister will be aware of the Financial Times report that the British Government plans new legislation to end the legal force of customs arrangements designed to avoid a hard border in Ireland. As an Executive Minister, can she update us on the Executive's discussions with the British Government on Brexit and the work of her Department in preparation for the EU exit and the implementation of the Protocol? I thank the member for his question. It is clear that we need to ensure that both the letter and spirit of the protocol are infused into the negotiations themselves and reflected in the negotiated outcomes. The member is correct. If reports are true, then this is entirely unacceptable. Any threat of a hard border on the island of Ireland must be resisted by this executive and indeed by this assembly. 
The Executive meets weekly to discuss EU exit issues, but it is clear to me and to the stakeholders that I have been engaging with that not enough clarity is being provided to Ministers from the British Government, and I will be pressing yet again at the Executive and the British Government directly for answers in light of these alarming reports. Businesses and communities are facing an unprecedented challenge, and they need answers. As my department is working to do all that we can to prepare, um, and I've just recently held sectoral meetings with the industries to discuss Brexit, it is really important that we work in partnership over the coming months. In addition, the member may wish to know that in the department's EU exit legislation programme, there are currently eight EU exit-related statutory rules at various stages of development which need to be made before the end of the transition period. It should be noted, though, that the number of SRs remain under review. The Department seeks to ensure it addresses any emerging need for legislation, particularly in relation to the developments in the UK EU negotiations on future arrangements. Okay, members, time is up for that session, and we're moving on now to the question to the Minister of Justice, and I call Orlea Flynn. The members just take your ease for a moment.